weather is quite important for us. The dog to us is exactly what we do. This is the village of Frampton on Severn, situated in the southwest of England. Apart from its boast of having the largest village green, it is like many other villages in Britain, providing what many would see as the perfect place to live. It is true that at first glance not much seems to go on here, but this is a living, working village. It is in such places that you will find the more unusual ways of earning a living. And so it is with Kevin Riak. This is his story and it starts in early spring. Kevin is a professional falconer, working out of his home in the village. It is the ideal base for his business, and in the time that he's lived here, Kevin has seen his turnover increase every year. His wife and children help out when an extra pair of hands are needed, but usually he manages on his own. One pound, one pound, and eight. What started out as a general interest in birds soon evolved into what Kevin describes as his obsession. When, at the age of 14, he first visited a bird of prey centre and watched as the resident falconer got his birds stooping to the law. From that point on, Kevin was hooked. It was then that he decided that one day, this is what he would do for a living. Good lad. He's been a professional for seven years and the main part of his business involves tuition, demonstrations and taking paying guests out right. hunting during the season. This enables Kevin to be involved with his birds every waking hour and he's not complaining. Everything in there. All animals and birds kept in captivity should always be well looked after. But working birds of prey needs that little bit extra attention if they are to be in peak condition. Exercise is a major consideration and a large part of Kevin's daily routine is taken up with building muscle on his birds. This he does by flying them. Kevin is in the enviable position of having total access to Frampton Court Estate. Set within its own beautiful parkland, it is the perfect place to work and train his birds. This new recruit is a male eagle owl, which goes by the name of Walnut. Kevin has had him since he was five days old, and at the age of six weeks, he is still trying to get off the ground. Kevin tries to take the young eagle owl everywhere. This way, a strong bond is formed, and also gives it the experience it will need if he's going to be a full member of the team. It won't be used for hunting, but Kevin would like it to be a main demonstration bird. Everything is a game at the moment, but in no time at all, this uncoordinated little bird will turn into a beautiful, graceful flyer. As with all human-animal relationships, this important bond involves an awful lot of food.
going to take one of the hawks out and give them a little bit of weathering. Double doors everywhere. Just before we do that, we're going to have a quick look at this breeding pair of Harris hawks in here. Just pop through this peephole. I once had a foot come flying through one of these holes. There's a female in here sitting on eggs and the male is constantly guarding the nest ledge. So they're due to hatch sometime soon. This is the way we breed hawks and focus in captivity in complete seclusion. Utilising things such as food shoots to pop food in so they never really realise exactly where the food comes from. Right, I'm going to pick Chaff up, take him outside and give him a little bit of weathering. He always puts his gloved hand in first. His entrance is, after all, an invasion of the bird's territory and can cause some birds to react by attacking. A little bit of weathering. something to eat. There you go. A nice day. Is it? <coughs> outside. What a nice day to be outside. Okay, this is Jaffa. It's a five-year-old male Harris hawk. Very good with guests. Due to go down to be molted out uh, quite soon. We're just going to put him out to weather in a moment. Uh, this is the, the muse facilities or the molting chamber that we use to, to molt birds out once a year. Some nice high perches, very clean environment. Above all else, a nice vertical barred window. Don't put hawks loose into, into chambers where there's, there's any mesh at all. The birds will grab onto it and the tail feathers will very quickly get damaged. So above all else, a vertical barred window is absolutely perfect. Right, I'll take you outside and pop you out to weather. The muse is at the back of Kevin's house. This makes security that much easier. Okay, this is Jaffa. We've just pulled out from the chamber. Being put out for, for a spot of weathering and perhaps a bath. There you go, mate. Okay. Weathering is quite important to hawks and falcons. They naturally keep themselves clean on a daily basis by one, having a bath, and two, preening the feathers. On a lovely day like today, hawks and falcons are naturally going to be encouraged to preen. The system that I've devised for the Harris hawks to sit on basically consists of a running bar between two car tyres. This not only enables the bird to come in and out as the weather changes, but it's also very easy to keep clean. Consequently, when I leave here some days, the birds are put out to weather and I may not be back until later on in the evening. So this way I know that the birds can get under cover if the weather changes and it perhaps starts pouring down with rain. It's not quite the, the, the most orthodox way of keeping hawks and falcons, but this system works very well for me. Uh, and, and above all else, I think the hawks enjoy it, the fact that they have freedom to go from one tyre to another. And it perhaps even encourages them to race a little bit during the part of the day. They're kept tethered on the on the tyres by means of a restraint system which consists of a, a pair of leather jesses around the bird's legs which in turn is attached to a swivel and on the end of that nowadays we use a, a length of leash material or a length of uh, braided terrelene rope. This restrains the bird to his perch, the leather around the jesses or the leather around the legs are basically kangaroo skin so we don't actually use leather anymore. Kangaroo skin is now proven to be half the thickness but twice the strength of leather so this makes it obviously convenient to use around any brewer's legs. Sometime along the next couple of days I'll pressure wash around the tyres and along the bar. The whole system is very much designed to be pressure washed and disinfected and kept uh, in a very clean condition obviously enhancing the bird's quality of life surrounded by nothing more than a, a clean environment. The muse, a word very often associated with horses, but its origins are in falconry, is quite a substantial building.
This provides the space needed for resting and breeding birds, or birds that are going through a molt. They can be here for anything up to six months. This is the newest addition to the Falconry display team. This is a 21 day old Lanner Falcon called Potter. He's waiting for his dinner. He's going through the stage at the moment that we call imprinting. So he associates humans with food, which at the end of the day makes a very good display falcon. So obviously he loses all his natural fear of man. And he's just at the point now where he's ready to start feeding for himself. But this one was taken a little bit later than I would have liked. So I'm just having to enforce the imprint in a little bit. He's filling his crop at the moment with chicken, quail and beef. Which he seems to like a lot of. And this is his third meal of the day. At the moment he's on about four meals a day consisting of approximately two ounces of food per time. That's your lot, mate. That's your lot. And just my finger. Just my finger. Obviously, the more the, the young falcon sees at this age, the less afraid he is of everything that he'll approach later on in life. What you got, mate? There's a little bit there. There's a little bit there. So by simply popping this cover on, he gets to see everything else that's going on. But it's obviously safe and protected in his own little environment. So any day now he'll be due to go into one of the chambers and the imprinting will carry on from there. He's starting to get a little bit too big for the box. Later in the day, on another part of the estate, Kevin is about to exercise his two-year-old Saker falcon. Sakers originate in the Middle East, where it is documented that they have been hunting with falcons for over 3,000 years. As falcons go, they are big birds but have a great turn of speed and plenty of stamina, and are popular with British falconers. The best way to exercise falcons is by getting them to stoop to a lure. This is usually a leather pouch attached to a long length of thin rope that is swung around the falconer's head. This simulates a moving target and induces the bird to make an attack or stoop. At the last moment, the lure is pulled away, causing the falcon to throw up in the air, gain height and try again. This gives the bird the best possible exercise. By making it work this way, it burns off excess fat and builds good strong bones and muscle. When Kevin feels that it's done enough, he attaches a small piece of food to the lure. When the bird comes round again, it will give the traditional falconer's call. This lets the bird know that on the next stoop, it will be allowed to catch it and get its reward. A bond must be formed early in the bird's life if you want the bird to keep on returning to the fist. Nature does nothing without a reason, so it is with falconry. In the bird's mind, you are the food provider. So why should it waste energy looking for its own prey, knowing full well that if it hangs around long enough, then food will be forthcoming. While the falcon feeds, Kevin attaches the jesses.
He likes his bird so much that he's ordered a new one and hopes to pick up the chick in a few weeks' time. If you remember earlier on, we had a, a young eagle owl that had a job to walk, never mind fly. I'm going to show you now how he's progressed. We're not expecting him to come dozens and dozens of times to the gauntlet for small pieces of food like we would do with the hawk. All we're asking of him is, is three or four straight line flights to the gauntlet for a good reward of food. You're all very good today, aren't you? You're all very good. Shh. I'm, I'm going to show you briefly how how accurate in a moment his pouncing can be. You can see him trying to kill the mole eels and catching daisies and it's all it's all play flying but this is how the bird learns to hunt for itself primarily in the wild lots and lots of practice attempts before he gets its right first time you need quite a lot of patience to fly owls obviously you're up against the fact that their hearing is about 15 times better than our hearing he's over there killing the mole eel at the moment Go on, walnut, kill those mole eels. So consequently, it's not what they're looking at, it's what they can actually hear, which is distracting them. The secret of owls is to give them a nice, good reward when they do come back. Here he comes. Well done, lad. Okay, I've got a small piece of meat, so we're just going to try and show you how an owl actually pounces on his food in the wild. So if we can attract his attention for a, a split second. So you can see even at this age, he's, he's quite accurate. He knows he's managed to catch some food. His feet went down at just the right place. Put the brakes on. Managed to seize his prey. The species originates from India, so a large proportion of his diet would be based around mice and rats. And he's still very much play flying, so he's learning how to pounce on things, killing molehills, pouncing on leaves that are getting away from him. Owls hunt primarily using their hearing first and their eyesight is secondary backup. So consequently, they behave and learn to fly a little bit differently to hawks and falcons. So we're going to give him the opportunity to come from the building that he's sat on at the moment. He's only been out a couple of minutes. Consequently, you should fly to the glove. There's a good lad. Right, I suppose we better put you back. Twice every week, Kevin visits centre parks in Wiltshire. The holiday company who run the site booked Kevin to do bird handling and flying demonstrations for its guests. For a professional falconer, this is a lucrative contract, which Kevin has worked hard to develop. Not only does it bring in a steady income, but it also gives him the opportunity to explain the finer points of falconry. Quite often, after seeing what it entails, Many of the guests will book to go out hunting with Kevin later in the year. It's a summer's day and little Potter has come along to keep an eye on things. Well, falconry started uh, approximately 4,000 years ago in Asia and China and Peru as a means of obtaining food for the table. So you'd set off with 
a predatory hawk or falcon and hopefully catch some food to feed yourself and the family. That, that's its original origins. Uh, sort of 700 AD, birds are being flown. So we practice it for very much the same reasons nowadays, apart from the fact that if the bird doesn't catch anything, we just go to Tesco's at the end of the weekend and get a week's worth of shopping. <laughs> so we don't quite have to rely on the birds for food providers anymore. And they're all bred in captivity, okay? So consequently, over the last 30 years, all birds of prey have been domestically bred, even though the, the parents may have originally come from the wild through some sort of disablement or, or uh, a reason why they couldn't go back into the wild. They were then put into, into chambers and in breeding enclosures. And we've been successful in breeding birds through uh, natural pairing and artificial insemination now for the last 30 years. So everything's bred in captivity. We don't have to shinny up trees anymore and take them from the wild. Every one of the birds that we breed in captivity can either be utilised for falconry or released back into the wild. You just don't release, uh, intentionally anyway, birds back into the wild where there's no need to. No. There's no need to release kestrels, for instance, or buzzards or sparrowhawks. There's, there's, there's plenty already. Uh, the peregrines are, are quite plentiful now. There's, there's peregrines from one of the countries to the other. So most of, of our indigenous species is, is pretty high up there as far as numbers go. Okay. We're going to start the session off by showing you briefly how to tie a highwayman's hitch, which is a, an old horse knot, okay? Come about six inches or so away from the ring with your left hand, mm -hmm. okay? And cut this tail here like a pair of scissors. And what you have to imagine is your hawk is sat perfectly still on your left hand. Okay, that's what you have to try and, try and imagine. Your left hand can't move at all. Everything's now done with your right hand. So cut like a pair of scissors a couple of inches down from that ring and move your left hand, your right hand, sorry, across to your left. So this sits in the nook of your thumb. That's why you cock your thumb up. So you cock your thumb up in the air and that sits in the nook of your thumb. We've now created a sort of triangle of some sort behind your forefinger. Have you got a triangle? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Hook your thumb into the triangle underneath the tail, okay? Mm -hmm. and gently pull a loop back over to the right hand side. Keep it hooked on your thumb. Keep this pinched on the ends of your fingers, on the ends as opposed to halfway up or down the bottom. And you've now got a hole with your thumb coming out the middle. This is still pinched on the end of fingers. Your bottom two fingers don't do anything at all. The last part of the knot is to bring that tail down right over the top and poke it in through, in through the top where your thumb comes out and gently pull through a little loop. Don't pull the whole tail through, just pull through a little loop on the other side. Okay. And if you've done it right and you pull the left hand side, it'll slide up to the ring. Yeah, and get tighter and tighter. Yeah, not too bad. Seem a nice group. You seem a nice group. You can never tell. Some, some people are... Uh, or some groups are a little bit like pulling teeth. <laughs> Trying to jolly them along a bit, but these seem a nice crowd of people. Lots of questions, which I like. So it means they're obviously quite interested. They're not just doing the falconry session for the sake of doing something different. So we're going to fly Caffrey around the corner. So I'll place a small piece of chicken between your, your thumb and forefinger. All you have to do is hold your left hand arm wow. slightly higher than your shoulder. Okay, keep your right hand down by your side. You land on the highest point, which is obviously your hand higher than your shoulder. You might stop for a quick camera shot and then back to his perch. Simple as that. This, here, this, this park, the area within a, a sort of mile of where we are, sustains two pairs of, of buzzards. Sometimes they'll come over and crisscross each other's borders and the little tussle ensue in, in the air uh, where one says, you know, this is our patch. And there's also a pair of kestrels and a pair of sparrowhawks within the park. So got one attached to his leg and one attached to his tail. And the bells are there purely as a means of location. So, so when you're practicing falconry, they're not retrievers. They don't bring things back to you, which is what a lot of people assume. They're hunting and catching food for themselves, remember, not for you. Obviously, you form the relationship with the bird, which allows you to take away here. <laughs> which allows you, he's looking at something over there. Yeah. <laughs> he's happy to allow you to take away from what he's caught as long as he gets a good reward of food for catching it. If he were to pretend to put a piece of chicken there, yeah, would he fly down? Yes. Or, he can't see it from up there that there's food. He, c there. he comes to the to the gauntlet, obviously expecting there to be food, because he's doing this. Out of repetition. <laughs> well, you wouldn't get his hair off. You'll, you'll come two or three times for an empty glove and then you just stop coming. So you've, you've sort of, through food, you've severed the bond a little bit. Everything the hawk does, it, he does for food. He doesn't do anything at all for, for no reason. There has to be uh, an end result. When you take a bird out to hunt, you want it to exert all of its energy at the time that you take it out. Okay. On the ground, you'll obviously seize whatever prey he's trying to catch. 
with his talons. He'll then drive those talons in around the head and start pulling immediately away. That's just a leather law pad down there. He's just, again, he, he's doing this at repetition. He's done it lots of times. He's killed that leather pad about a thousand times now. <laughs> but one of the first things he does is mantle. Okay, so that's called mantling. He's, he's mantling his prey with his wings and his tail. And that's where mantle piece comes from, something that surrounds your fireplace or a lady's mantle, a, a cloak she'd wear. It's to shield it from the likes of that buzzard or any other predators that might see that he's on the ground and vulnerable and eating an easy meal. So if you're bigger than the hawk that's on the ground and he's eating, there's no reason why you can't fly down next to him, chase him away and steal what he's worked hard to catch. So they automatically mantle on, on catching food. Now, in order, in order to take away from the hawk what he's caught, you have to give him a reward for catching it. So if that was a rabbit, and I listen for the bells, he's going to be 30 or 40 yards away from where I last saw him, take hold of the, 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 the rabbit, throw a piece of food to one side, and he's happy to give the rabbit up as long as he gets a reward of food for catching it. So while he's happily tucking into his, his ounce or so of chicken there, or quail, then I can turn around and pop the rabbit in the bag. The session went well and the guests seemed quite pleased. Kevin has even managed to pick up a new client. Hunting in Gloucestershire for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> That's my Christmas present. I'll put the turkey to on myself. the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is our, our fifth yearly visit. Every year we come with our three sons. And the reason we, we come down is curiosity to see how falconry works and just to see the displays. Um, Probably see the birds in flight, sort of catching some food, um, as though it might seem like prey. So it'd be interesting to see how the see the bird in flight, if that's what it does. Yeah. They're larger than I thought. Not mm. larger. Yeah, close up. Oh well, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, seen, it was really good fun. Yeah, I've seen displays a couple of times before, but uh, you know, it's completely different being able to hold the birds and see them fly onto you, glove and everything. It's I was rather hoping we'd do a bit of uh, swinging the lure and getting, like you see at the uh, displays, but uh, obviously there's not enough time. Well, I think that takes a bit, a bit yeah. more training, maybe. <laughs> but no, it was well worth it. It was yeah. very good. Enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. It's very really nice being close to the birds. Yeah. Okay, it's a lovely morning this morning. I'm off to a, a local show today at Thornbury, Thornbury Mock Fair. Uh, just a small event really in the town centre, but it's the perfect opportunity for me to uh, do a little bit of advertising for the business. So, consequently, I've decided to take two birds along. Probably one of the Harris Hawks and uh, the young eagle owl that's out there. This will be his first sort of adventure out, if you like, in uh, in quite a busy area. So we'll, we'll give him a we'll give him a try this morning and see how he gets on around quite a few people. I'm only there for a couple of hours and it's only down the road so if it doesn't work out we're not that far away really. Put, pop him back in the crate and, uh, and get him back later. So I'm just going to load these couple of birds up now, load up the vehicle and then we'll be off in the next 10 minutes or so. Okay? Hello work this morning. There you go. There's a good man. This is Caffrey, this is the, the hawk I've decided to take with Thornbury. Very steady little bird. He doesn't like uh, walking too far on his fists. He's happy to fly to absolutely anybody over a Time. The tail guard I'm popping on at the moment is just purely to protect his tail while he's travelling. So he's quite happy travelling. Obviously turning around in a small environment such as the, the, the converted crate here. There's the possibility of him damaging his tail which is the last thing we want. So the, the tail guard is designed to just keep on and keep off. You get used to it at a young age. You finished. This is a uh, this is young walnut. 
probably saw a few weeks ago when we were actually actually trying to get him to fly. So he's now flying extremely well, flying to absolutely anybody and everybody. About four weeks on from when we last saw him. Okay, okay. Just put them on the scales. Out of curiosity, he's two pound three ounces. Okay, so that's the two birds. We'll get them rolled into the van and we can get off. It looks like the barn has got a nice treat today. An absolute main essential in every muse, a good mouse trap. Mice are around all of the time wherever you've got birds really, wherever there's food. But obviously, uh, That's what you're naturally feeding really. There's no poison put around here in any place. So that can go into the food box with the quail and everything else. Put a little bit later on. And the barn owl will relish the little mouse. Kevin's local town is Thornbury, and the Mop Fair has been held here every spring for hundreds of years. Many local products are on sale. You can, hold it like that, but I use the you can even like learn a new skill. You've got the idea. Held in the centre of town, it's his first show of the year and with several thousand visitors expected, it is the perfect place to start selling his new hunting vouchers. Kevin arrives early, just as the fair is about to be officially opened. The birds are brought obviously to enhance people's enjoyment of the birds that are actually out on the stand so as well as being quite a draw towards the stand obviously I get to en educate some of the people that are, that are not over clued up as to what predatory birds are you coming out lad pop his tail guard off Look, looks much prettier without that on Right from the start, the birds attract the curiosity of the public, yeah. and Kevin is soon in conversation. Better than socks, pants, and aftershave, anyway. Yeah, yeah. A Harris hawk from South America. All sorts of people visit fairs like this, and while his birds are admired by the majority of visitors, he does, on occasions, have to deal with a small fraction who consider what Kevin does as cruel. Kevin, in his usual diplomatic manner, explains that his birds that are very bird? well looked after, have <laughs> many opportunities to fly away, and will very likely live three times longer than a bird in the wild. <laughs> yeah, the bird doesn't like dogs very much. More usually, people are quite happy just to ask questions and swap stories. I have, yeah. I used to fly birds up there actually at Muncaster Castle. Place, it is it? a lovely place, yeah. Yeah, a lot of owls there. But it's actually a. Barn owls an incredible population of those in, in, in Cumbria. Yeah. 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 You can see three or four a night, can't you? Just driving That's around. Right. And, yeah. 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 This bird's called Walnut. About the same size as his brain. 
Help yourself to a leaflet if you like one. There's plenty down there. This is uh, an Indian eagle owl. It is, it is. I love it. Lovely place. A lovely place. It is, it's a lovely place. Yeah. A lot, and a lot of people, is, they don't sort of class it as part of the lakes, do they? Yeah. Kevin is a happy man. His long-awaited chick has finally arrived. Hello, lad. You had a good first night out. So he's got some breakfast. What have we got in here? What have we got in here? This is a, a young sacred falcon. Five weeks old now. Just just started feeding for himself. Saker falcon originates from the Middle East. It's a, a hot climate bird. And basically, I utilize exotic species for display purposes. So he's being trained and flown exactly the same way as the, the Lana falcon, which we're gonna go out a little bit later on and see how we got on with that one. That was the last small bird that we saw. So this is the, the latest acquisition tucking into his breakfast of chicken and rat. Diced chicken and diced rat. He's having his, or he's had his first night out here in, in what we call a little lofting building really. He's at the age where he's, he's just started to get out of boxes. He's now crumbling around and getting up to all sorts of mischief. The last thing that I want to happen is for him to hop out of a box, go running across to one of the Harris Hawks and become a meal within a meal. As far as the other hawks are concerned, this is the ultimate food package. Got one more piece in there? No, you've had enough, haven't you? You've had enough. Mm. Okay, that's you fed up for the next couple of hours anyway. We're going to head off in... Looks like it's uh, perfect flying time again. We're going to head off and exercise that young Lana falcon that you haven't seen for a while, so you can see just how he's getting on now. Right, Tim. There's a phone call from a friend about a falcon he has right, spotted okay. flying well, I'll, free. I'll go on out, Tim. He knows Kevin has lost one and thinks right. this may be it. Kevin is hoping that it's his peregrine that decided to go off hunting right, okay, on its own then. back in the winter. Okay, then I'll, I'll nip over and have a look, and then if it's him, then then uh, you'll come down straight away. Losing birds okay. this way is a risk Here's all a, falconers da -da. take. That's why I just saw sort of Consistent when I spoke to Ange. Well done. <laughs> well done. Well, I'm the over there in Super Lawn. See if he's about. I got the lightning pins out, that's all I could think of doing. And it, when he saw that, like, he, he saw, saw that lace bricks. He dropped. <laughs> Time to go. He dropped, but then went straight off here. Yeah. Right, I'll get him. If the Falcon was here, it's gone now. Never in the right place at the right time. <laughs> the chances are that if he's obviously on the wing, then he can see me from anything up to a mile and a half away. If he sat in a tree the other side of that house, he can't see me from a hundred yards, so. Half an hour later, there's still no luck. <coughs> Call it a day here. Just, uh, just waiting for Martin to, to feed around some of the chambers out there. He's, uh, he's got quite a few imprinted falcons that, that uh, get a little bit worried when there's strange sights and sounds that are going on. Uh, consequently, he's, he's around there feeding them at the moment, so they've got something to, to concentrate when we go around, or Martin goes around and, and pulls the Jura peregrine out of uh, 
out of the chambers he's got around there. So he'll just be a couple of minutes while he's feeding around. And while I'm waiting, I might as well have a quick cup of tea. Kevin's driven over to Monmouth in Wales. He's picking up another new bird, a Gia Peregrine Cross, which has been specifically bred for him by Martin Jones, who specialises in breeding birds of prey and producing high quality falconry equipment. You're doing that system, okay, okay. fine, yeah. Yeah, oh, you're, you're on. Um... I've got nine pairs of these new Oh, yeah. They're just. Yeah. Kevin has bought birds off Martin before, so he knows they'll be fit and healthy. It's just, you know, it's particularly prevalent in Jers and Merlins, as you yeah, know, yeah. and then it can be quite lethal in them. So it's just a case. When the bird is brought in, the first thing they must do is fit a hood and attach the anklets. Put it the other way. The falcon is held with a cloth. This is to make sure that its feathers do not get damaged. And the reason for hooding is exactly the same principle as putting a cloth over a parrot's or budgie's cage to keep it quiet. Because birds of normal diurnal birds of prey won't fly in the dark. Because nature weeded out those nutcases that did, because they bumped into things and broke feathers. And you, nature never makes the predator that much faster than the prey. Otherwise the predator wipes everything out and then it starts to death itself. And one or two broken feathers can make all the difference between success and failure. So if they flew in the dark, bumped into things, broke some feathers, they starved to death. So by natural selection, they don't fly in the dark. So you can take a perfectly wild falcon, pop a hood on its head, and they'll sit quietly. It is hoodwinked or fooled into thinking it's dark. One of the old words we get from falconry. There we go. It's got, see, that it's, it has to fit down into the gape so that it can open its beak properly. But with one of these hoods, they're quite firm. It's a little bit like fitting a bowler hat. You know, it's got to be absolutely spot on. If you have a softer hood, it's a bit more like a flat hat. It'll fit on whether it's slightly too large or slightly too small. But these have got to be absolutely bang on. And the whole idea is that the bird shouldn't be able to see light. It should fit tightly around the beak opening here. And you see, we flared it out slightly so that it doesn't cut into the side. And also, you, the next trick is you pull the plume down towards its toes just to make sure that it can't hook it off with its talons if it tries to scratch it off. There we go. The only reason for that plume is for something to hold on to when you take the hood on and off. Then you have these little braces at the back which are two short toggles for opening the hood, getting the hood off, or pull the two long ones. And of course the bird's sitting on one hand so you actually have to pull the other side normally with your teeth. And you try and get an even pull Otherwise, you have a nasty habit of detaching the bird's head from its body, which is not very good in animal welfare terms. So it does require a little expertise. Well, you have to remember that, uh, as we were yeah. saying before about broken feathers, you know, the reason for that we, we don't keep these things in cages is they don't understand wire, they don't understand glass. They'll try and fly straight through it. And you just break all the wings and tail feathers, because all they do is, because they've got these strong claws, they can hold on to the wire, sit back on their tail, break all their tail feathers and break all their wing feathers, which doesn't make them very successful flyers. So that's why the whole tethering system is involved. And the birds get very used to it very quickly. Over to you. Now comes the fun bit, trying to get him to stand okay. on your hand, yeah? No. Nope. Whoopee, let him go. Better taking him outside so he doesn't hit against things. Actually, go out, go out the front there. Just so you don't smack his wings against anything. Try and get the hawk to balance. One on the glove and one obviously with his hood on. We're trying to make sure that this doesn't get tangled too much. We can leave the swivel protrude in a little bit. So it can okay. And sooner or later, he'll latch onto something. 
and a bit like that. Very much a case of sort of moving with the bird until he actually gets Do you his spray him or you like? Yeah, you can just spray him on. Yeah, please. The other thing is sometimes we just damp them down a little bit. Again, they don't like flying when their feathers are wet, just, just as any bird doesn't like doing it. And it can make them just sit still and it'll cool them down a bit. Oh, oh there you go, boy. I'll spray Kevin as well whilst we're at it. Again, if you just spray, the, just damp the wing tips and the tail tips, it just softens them a bit so there's less risk of damage in the early stage if he does just thrash about a bit at this stage. There you go, see how it's tightened him up? Makes him look a little bit bedraggled, yeah. but it, in this warm weather it isn't going to matter at all. I did say, uh, this, this bird's obviously been ordered for six months, uh, and I did say to Martin at the start of the year that uh, I didn't, didn't really show any preference as to what colour uh, hybrid I I required the colour I find sort of pretty irrelevant really, but they do they do come in the female jurors do come in th sort of several different colour phases, the three main ones that's black, silver, and white. Uh, and you can see he's sitting there quite calmly now. He's been now he's damped down a little bit and he's actually realised how to sit on the glove. How to <coughs> much better sitting up the right way than it is hanging upside down, twirling around. Put that out of the way in case he falls off. Right, I've got a young Kessel up here that's been out at hack all day. I'm just going to call him in now. This is one of the things I like to do with young birds. Is to just leave them out and let them get on with learning how to fly. Uh, and we're just going to call him in now for his supper. So hopefully he's been doing a lot of flying around today. Small piece of food. This is how easy it is. <whistles> well, it's normally easier than this. I think the handle of the scent is a little bit steep, so we'll try the other part of the garden. One of the advantages of having them at hack is they get very so they get very warm. When they're focusing on something. It doesn't matter which way I move my hand. Kestrel's head stays motionless when he's actually focusing on something else. Something you don't really get to see unless you see them when they're hovering. Because if he takes his eyesight off the prey for more than a split second in the wild, he could end up going hungry. So nature's just giving him lots of vertebrae in his neck, which enable him to keep his head still. Let's pop you away for now. After many weeks, Kevin eventually gets back his long lost peregrine. This is Paddy, a two year old female peregrine falcon. The prodigal returns. This bird was actually lost in January while game hawking hit ducks. She decided while she was waiting on that she was going to drift off downwind catch and kill something herself 
which made retrieving her quite difficult that day and consequently she was lost and has been lost for the last four months. Found two days ago on Bedminster Downs on a pigeon. All of the birds I have have my own phone number around the, the leg, attached to a closed ring. So a swift return. She's in this chamber or going to be released into this chamber to moat out and get a complete new set of feathers. She's back now a little bit battered than the worst for her time out in the wild. So it's simply a case of putting a pair of scissors to these anklets and releasing her for the next six months. Okay, we're going to cut these anklets off now. Make sure she's got nothing around her legs while she's in here for the next couple of months molting out. Bird wants to be completely free. There's no need of tethering equipment while you're molting a hawk. So that's one. And that's two. I'm going to keep the hood on, obviously, until the last second that she's placed upon the perch. Falcons very rarely move anywhere at all when they're blindfolded. The pur whole purpose of the hood is to keep the bird calm and settled until you reach such a point that you're about to fly it. So she's ready now to simply pop up on a high perch, release the hood, and that's her for the next six months. That's her anklets off. I'm just going to get her near the perch. Okay, Paddy. This is you for the next six months, darling. There you go. Kevin's design of the weathering area really comes into its own. He can do a thorough job of washing and disinfecting it all in half the time than if he used a more conventional setup. With summer over and all his obligations completed, this is the time of year Kevin looks forward to, getting out with a group of friends and going hunting. It's not big bags they're after. What gives them all a buzz is watching the birds fly. Better put on my telemetry so I can track my bird. Come here, you. Stay, not you. Sit. Sit. Oh, I need me shades, do I? <laughs> Kevin has arranged this day's hunting over grounds not far from his home, with permission of the gamekeeper. He hopes to get at least one flight for each bird. It's decided that Lindsay will fly her goshawk first. The one she's brought today has had some crow feathers fitted into its tail, probably to replace missing or broken ones. This is common practice amongst falconers and enables the bird to stay in top flying condition. The falconers call this imping. 
the goshawk is nature's stealth hunter. Its usual tactics are to fly fast and low, using trees or a hedge as cover, and at the last second, flip into view and grab a panicking bird as it tries to flee. About one in five attempts are successful. Yeah, where do those partridge go? Are they put into that? Yeah, I think that's that. There's about ten in there. Yeah, I'll let him settle a bit. He got a bit tangled up there. Branch went up the back of the telemetry and you, the bird was stuck in the tree. You uh, stuck by his tail in the tree. Oh, no. Never seen that happen before. But, uh, never pulled his tail? Never pulled no, his nearly out. pulled his tail feathers out. But the telemetry, it had gone up behind the barrel of the telemetry, the thorn bush, and the bird was just stuck there and he couldn't chase the pheasant. He was shut out. Ten partridge gone into that cover there, look. Yeah, I just didn't come scrubbing around no. trying to reflush that one. Do you want to try that? Yeah. Go for it. Just, just, you, 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 just send Lindsay in. Just send Lindsay in somewhere. And then when she's in position, we'll run the dogs through. Yeah. And he, he can go off the little bit of partridge. Yeah. Okay. Bring those partridge in there. Good morning. In a straight flight with fit quarry, the goshawk will seldom catch up. This is nature's way of weeding out the slower weaker individuals. The, the trouble is this time of the year that the, anything that we're flushing, any partridge or pheasant uh, are running, obviously it's late in January, so nothing really sits that well to the point. We had a good point in the hedgerow there and the pheasant just decided to run up and down and up and down and try and avoid being spotted again by the dogs. Yeah. Didn't really count. I had to work, really had to work for that one. You got grabbed in the process, David. Now run into a thorn bush. We, we both dived into this bush from different. I both have, fell over and he had all, fence. Yeah, he had hold of the pheasant, and he's hanging on to him like that. And we were like trying to get through these thorn bushes. That's where so jumped with her. Got smacked in the face with a thorn bush. Tripped over some wire, and uh, and he was still hunting it. Yeah, but we did need the dog in there, mind. Something running around in that cab. Well, I would have thought we'd have got a pheasant up there, but not, you know, with a, like, I reckon it's red legs. What do you reckon? No comment. Yeah. We've, uh, we've just put off some duck and on the little flight pond in this little bit of a spinny here. There's some teal that I've put in. So this bird hasn't caught anything yet other than partridge. Even though I've been trying for the last two months to, to get him to take pheasant. Try and gain a little bit of height. Uh, and then if I bring him in over the pond, we'll see if we can flush the teal off and see if you will obviously I've got it coming down to catch one. But this will be the first flight at anything other than partridge really, so better get on now and see what we can do. Dog's gone off again. There's a lot of excitement as the bird waits on overhead. The duck doesn't want to leave the safety of the pond. Here he is. Oh, nicely knocked. When it does, the stoop is made. A close shave for the duck. Kevin flushes another. But the falcon doesn't see it. Mark's peregrine has more luck. Falcons kill their prey by immediately severing the windpipe. But Mark moves in just to make sure. He's been flying this falcon over two or three seasons. An experienced bird will nearly always put a meal on the table. Although the duck is dead, the muscle spasms cause quite a bit of movement and it is easy to see how a falcon could soon get its feathers damaged if it were not careful. If this were a totally wild bird, then this thrashing about would probably cause it to release its prey. 
Wild birds would be severely slowed if any of their feathers were damaged. Better to let go and live to try again. Definitely dead neighbour. Here they go, they're going back in. Off by these. There's the tiller. The tiller, the tiller definitely going, I'll guarantee it. I'll have to go on these. If, if we could all keep in like a bunch together, then the bird will wait over us to go spread out. The bird will, will know who to look for. Ah, oh, he's okay now. Just undoing the jesses, or the bullet jesses, the modern way of tying a bird up. Strike in the hood. Making sure that my hood is safe before I take off. Can you see him, Dave? Go on, can you see him? Yeah, yeah, he's right in the front. He's just put another rock down now. There he goes. Can you see him? He's only got about 300 to play with. <laughs> he's just put another one down. <laughs> Amongst them, yeah, he's right in amongst them. There he goes, he's on one now. As far as I know, I think the bird's caught a, a couple of crows over the last few weeks, so that's not a good sign. Which all it means is the bird is very obedient when you're flushing something, then after two or three minutes it tends to go rather pear-shaped if your bird just disappears over the horizon chasing other things. Obviously realises it doesn't need to be with you when it needs something to eat. <laughs> So hopefully it'll come back if it hasn't caught anything, otherwise Dave's got a crow to put in the bag. After a couple of hours, Dave did eventually get his bird back. It was late in the day, the sun was getting low, and there was still one bird left to fly. Kevin chose to go to a place where he hoped there would be a pheasant or two. If he doesn't flush something within the next half hour, he will cancel the rest of the hunt. There you go. This is because the pheasants will need the remaining daylight in order to get up to roost for the get night. The other David is now about to fly his bird, a first year Tearsel. He has high hopes for this. Tiersel is French, meaning one-third, and is always the name given to the male peregrine, which, as in all birds of prey, is about one-third the size of the female. The female peregrine is always called the falcon. The reason for the size difference is that when a breeding pair are occupying a territory, all quarry becomes available to the pair and any chicks they may have. The stronger, heavier female is able to take the large quarry, whilst the lighter, more agile male would only catch the smaller, faster birds. But falconers can teach their birds to punch above their weight. Well, I, I missed the actual strike, it hit it apparently, didn't it? It's, it's refused its last four cock pheasants, <coughs> but different ground, a bit later in the day. Didn't quite know what to expect off above a copse. No, I was pleased, he, uh, at least he had a go at it. Got some guts. Haven't you? Because last one you hit, I think you bruised your feet. Not bad day, Dave. 
absolutely brilliant, Kev. Well, yeah, thanks for inviting so. me. That's all right. Um, we've had some great support, and you know, thank God it's kept dry. And uh, it was nice to see Mark out and about with his bird and the old duck hawk there. <laughs> hey, what yeah, well, we have at good, the end? Wasn't it? We had a, yeah. one red leg, one one duck, yeah. one pheasant. Oh yeah, we caught a pheasant. Yeah, Dave's little taste catch that, uh, right? Hit a cock bird. Hit a cock bird, which for a small bird, yeah. I was one like uh, David taking on Goliath, wasn't yeah. it? And that your falcon, your falcon hit a teal. Yeah, the first yeah. first one that he's had a go at. But, uh, but I didn't lose him. What was a plus? Yeah. Instead of a ten mile <laughs> run around, tracking <laughs> through people's <laughs> gardens. <laughs> You know, well, so you going for an hour? I know it's gone for yeah, but I went off with Mark tonight. You know, yeah. but uh, yeah, no, it's yeah. Good he got day. his bird back. Yeah. I found that when he was on the bridge. Yeah, ah, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah well, I found him out. Thank God, got mobile phone. Right right yeah. yeah, you know, <laughs> I reckon those teal were the best quarry though. Yeah, yeah. Oh, very super excellent quarry. Excellent quarry. Never put one in the bag, but lots of fun chasing. That's what it's all about. The end of the day, it's the game in it, really. It's the flights, the flights, flights, and the it's the sport, not the kills. And not catching many things. Yeah, you've probably seen 15, 20 flights today. Oh, at least. Yeah, at least. Yeah, and yeah, we've had a good mix, good mix bag, really. And uh, you know the dogs haven't been strung up on the tree, so yeah. that's a plus. No, <laughs> bonus. Yeah. Feeling nice but to finish um, the season off. So, all right. Well, that's about the end of the season now. Really, for me, uh, quite a successful year. All the falcons that I flew this season all caught really well. Uh, this young Jir Peregrine Hybrid finished off the season with about 22 head a game, all in all. So, look forward to picking him up. Picking him up next season out of the chamber, so over the next week or so he'll be fattened up in weight, uh, taken up to a, uh, quite a fat weight, and then put in a chamber. Uh, other than that, that's about it for the year. It's all displays, tuition, handling, and film work for the next six months or so before I'm off to start hunting again.